But yes, I'm really happy to be here with everyone. Um, thank you for taking the time to um, to hear about uh, this research. And um, I'm really appreciating the different folks' backgrounds and think it'll be fruit uh, uh, foundation for a fruitful discussion. Um, so my uh, presentation title is Regenerating Urban Forests Using Participatory Modeling to Bridge Science, Equity, and Community. Like Kai said, my name is Axel Campana. I use he and they pronouns. Um, I'm a graduate research assistant at the Department of Geography at Portland State University. Um, next slide, please. I just wanted to say a little bit about myself and also about like why this research matters to me. So in the top left-hand corner, and I'm just checking screens, okay. In the top left-hand corner, um, is a picture of, uh, you know, an idyllic uh, <laughs> picture of like where I grew up. Uh, you know, I actually grew up kind of semi-suburban, semi-rural, rural, but um, but this is the foothills of the Appalachians that's in that top uh, left-hand picture. Um, and so I grew up around a lot of trees um, and trees also were an important refuge for me um, from, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, a, 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 a lot of social violence, whether it be at school or at home, um, and so uh, the environment for me is a, is a place of refuge um, and healing. Um, and so it makes sense that my path has led me to um, thinking about healing and also environmental justice um, and the connection between the two. And then the lower left hand corner is a picture of what I would describe as my homeland. And so I grew up in Georgia. All of my family is from um, southern Texas. Uh, and so this is the hill country uh, to the northwest of San Antonio. And it's when I was in Texas, it's it's the place I feel most at home, the place I feel most connected to. Um, and then, um, you know, this is also where my ancestral history is deepest. Um, so then, and you know, the, now I li live in the Northwest, in the Pacific Northwest, um, uh, in Portland, Oregon. Um, and so the, la the two, two right hand pictures are pictures of, um, you know, uh, of that area. So the bottom is the Tuolumne River, um, and then the top is um, in southeast Portland, actually, in a little refuge um, in the middle of Reed College. Um, and so coming here has meant connecting with the land here and connecting with place here, and I'm on an ongoing journey to try to make that um, more meaningful and deeper. Um, but so I call this place home now. Um, and in that light, in that light, um, I want to uh, just acknowledge the traditional territory of where I live. Um, that it is traditional territory of Multnomah, Waklala, Kalthamit, uh, and Clackamas bands of the Chinook, as well as the Tualatin band of the Kalapuya. Um, I'll show a picture later exactly where I live, but I live at the, there's a little, there's hills to the west side of, of Portland and at the, they're called the Tualatin Hills uh, because they create a little basin. Um, so on the opposite side of them, the Willamette Valley peaks up and is flat land um, that's called the Tualatin Basin. Um, and I live at the little, like at the very bottom of those hills. Um, so also just acknowledging, like I won't be able to go into it, but the history of exclusion, um, extraction, um, and conflict um, that's on this land. And um, I think that um, if people are curious, um, I think that, that this particular resource at PSU does a great job of talking about that. So, um, so yeah, an another thing I wanted to describe is <clears throat> that um, I came into this work um, uh, primarily through if my, my first vector, my first like influence in getting into this kind of work um, was actually social movements. Um, and in particular, it was um, a, it was social movements that were able to depict and create a microcosm of a possible future that I felt inspired by. Um, and through that work, I began to facilitate general assemblies and just like be more engaged with people and became more concerned with and interested in um, collective learning and our, our community learning, our group learning. Um, and so, and then, you know, and as a psychologist, um, I was really concerned with social ecological theory and not only um, the social components, uh, not just like individual individuals moving through um, institutions and communities, but also the physical environment and how that influences um, our health and well-being, mental health and well-being. Uh, I want to take a moment as well to just acknowledge and give gratitude to all the people that have been involved with in that journey for me. And just quickly, I just want to name my colleagues Nahal Rastapur and Kate Gregory, who are superheroes, and my advisors Joel Ajibade, um, David Bannis, Aaron Ramirez, and Kyle Mehta, as well as many friends and, and family. Okay, so getting into the meat of it, um, 
and checking with all of you. There we go. Why trees? So um, for me, um, it's less about trees and it's more about urban ecology and thinking about the connections um, between uh, social and political uh, factors and, and drivers and how that actually impacts um, uh, quality of life and also um, ecological processes um, in the urban environment, but I mean in the global environment, but it's especially pronounced in the urban environment. Um, and then, you know, trees are uh, charismatic megafauna that can be an entry point to a relationship with land and place. And so that's, um, that's why I'm concerned with trees and why I center trees in my, in my, um, in my research, um, because I think trees are easier to relate to than like networks of connections um, that are somewhat abstract. Um, the, yeah, there's another one. So, um, so like, I, like uh, Kai mentioned, the, the broader connection, uh, broader work that um, I'm connected to in, in my lab um, is, uh, is funded by, is National Science Foundation funded. Um, and that work, in that work, we're taking uh, uh, multiple approaches to try to understand uh, why inequities have persisted um, in Portland. And I'll describe that problem a little bit more later. But um, so we're conducting interviews with NGO and governmental experts uh, doing geospatial analysis um, that's focused on understanding the relationship between um, ur urban enclosure. Uh, and so these areas that have been historically um, very exclusive, um, historically wealthy and uh, predominantly white um, and have remained so to this day um, that tend to have more uh, that, that don't tend to they just they have more tree canopy cover um, and also uh, so social processes uh, and policies that uh, like gentrification and ongoing reinvestment and redevelopment that cause people to move around and cause displacement. So we're interested in those, how those two things in the urban environment in, uh, influence uh, tree canopy, tree health, and urban heat. Um, and then we're also uh, doing policy analysis. And so looking for the last 100 years of documents, and all this work is ongoing um, related to tree, urban greening, and forestry. <clears throat> and what we're learning is like a lot of different stuff, but what applies to my project um, is that there's a high level of uncertainty in expert practitioners due to the complexity of the problem. Um, so there's multiple ways of learning that, um, uh, you know, there's the attempt to use um, uh, census data to try to understand something like displacement, which is um, somewhat unreasonable to try to do. And there's also learning from our actual interviews. And so what we've learned is that, you know, there's, since there's a delayed impact um, from actions taken to uh, results um, that contributes to the complexity of this problem and the difficulty predicting um, what, uh, what will happen and who tree planting initiatives will benefit in the long run. Um, there's ongoing economic and social processes that are moving people around so that there's not any particular population that is attached to a place um, for any, any like long period of time. Um, there's short political cycles that don't allow for um, consistent implementation of policies, but also prevent feedback um, on the result of those policy decisions. And then there are also siloed local agencies, um, and, and Portland is, is very specific to a commissioner form of governance, um, where commissioners are in charge of bureaus, and commi commissioners are politically elected. Um, so bureaus aren't able to cooperate or coordinate um, their approach effectively due to politics. Um, there are also just inherently many actors um, in the urban space that are impact trees. So uh, lots of people touching trees, lots of dogs peeing on trees. Um, there are many actors and coordinating action is necessary in order to, uh, in order to have a, a cohesive strategy. And then there are also pathway and legacy, pathway effects and legacy effects. And that's what I'm gonna kind of get into a little bit more. And so, um, you know, Portland, um, what we're looking at is, uh, it's got a little bit messy. Let me see what it looks like to you. Um, still a little bit messy, but what we're looking at is, um, is let me skip a few slides forward actually uh, for myself. Apologies, one sec. Well, okay, there we go. So, um, oh, sorry, I've misplaced my slides. Okay, here we are. Here we are. Oh, hang on, now everything's frozen, sorry. 
Well, uh, I'll look at your screen, what you're looking at. So the um, you're looking at um, homeowners loan corporation boundaries, um, which um, were were the maps that were created in the 1930s ish um, to to for the federal government to determine where they would uh, apply, uh, where people could apply for loans um, to assist them with with buying a home. Um, and so we're looking at that, um, which were labeled relatively A, B, C, and D categories, with C and D being the worst category. So you see those in yellow and red and um, overlaid with tree canopy cover. Um, and so um, the, man, everything is still frozen. <laughs> Sorry. The main point here is that um, there, the, so there's there's two effects happening here. The main one I want to point at is the if you look the difference between um, between uh, you see there's like a and actually I wish I could point at it. There's a there, where the yellow lines on the east side of the city end. Um, generally, the area that is west of that area is very different in Portland than the area that's east of that area. So the areas that don't have any, in, that are in the Portland boundary that have no redlining maps, um, those areas were annexed uh, much later into the city. And so um, as a result, um, they have different kinds of infrastructure. They often don't have sidewalks. Um, they, um, their sewer and electric lines run differently and inconsistently. Um, and they also tend to have different kinds of trees and, um, and less trees. Um, it depends on where you are as you move further out of the city. Like clearly, like you're moving into an areas that are on the edge of the urban growth boundary, and so um, those areas are a little bit more treed. But um, but this is a, a unique like factor that is you know from the '90s and '80s and '90s that still we can still see today. Um, let's see if my screen has stopped free freezing. No, it hasn't. Okay, we're just gonna quit. Back in. If you uh, if you let me know how you'd like to advance, I can just use these as the reference. I appreciate that. Thanks. It'll be fixed in just a sec. Sorry for the delay. Great. Um, and then um, let's see. So, so yeah, these, so if we can move on to the next slide, actually, I think I intended to have this slide in front of that one. So, um, so this is the, an example of the um, homeowners loan corporation maps um, and as they apply to Portland um, in a little bit more clear of a way. And unfortunately um, these, these uh, areas that were considered hazardous um, at the time, uh, people of color were considered hazardous. And so um, they were overwhelmingly low income and uh, communities of color that were um, that had red lines drawn around them. And that meant that they couldn't get um, they couldn't get an investment from the federal government. And it also became a signal for where um, private capital should invest as well. And then also created a pathway effect for um, where um, future decisions around investment uh, investments like um, negative investments like the highway or um, like where are we where are we going to build a new hospital and display and like displace books from um, and so especially this um, uh, the most northernmost red area uh, is the historically black area of Portland and interestingly enough um, the downtown right below that area across the river is not redlined but is also historically black um, previous to be, uh, folks being displaced and uh, siloed into the historical Albina, Albina area, which is that um, topmost um, red, red, red area. Okay, next slide, please. And so what we see today is that um, uh, the deaths from heat, heat, heat wave mortalities aren't random. Um, and so, um, and so we see that they're clustered in particular areas. And then if you go to the next slide, we see that um, actually they are overwhelmingly clustered in areas that were either were redlined um, or C and D areas or are on the edge of um, B areas. And so if you look at, there are several red dots that, that indicate locations of deaths um, and they're in blue areas. But if you notice, none of them are in green areas and they're always on the very edge. 
Um, and then you'll notice that also that there are some deaths, there are a cluster of deaths in downtown, and there's a couple of reasons why that could be. There's a large ho uh, houseless population in downtown due to the services being centralized, but also, like I said, that area, um, that area e experienced disinvestment and then uh, re renewal and, uh, and gentrification as well. It just wasn't, wasn't on the red, on the redlining maps. Okay. Um, okay, so there are a couple other legacy effects. You can go to the next slide. Um, and these are east-west side effects. So um, in Portland, this is a picture of Portland from 19, 1879, um, taken from the West Hills. And so it's, Portland's called Stumptown because when settlers came, they cut down all of the trees um, uh, within, the, within the, like the main city area in order to develop, develop um, that area. And also it was done in service of um, industry. Um, and so, um, and so there's a, even today you can see a east side, west side kind of impact. Can you go to the next slide? Where, oh, I'm sorry, uh, previous slide. So, um, can you go one more slide back? Okay. So this is the picture of the, the, all the, all the trees being cut down and you can go to the next slide. And this is the legacy effect of that, or the pathway effect of that, namely that you see there's a west side, east side um, distinction, where the west side has tons of trees and the east side has not as many trees. And then this map doesn't have the red line, uh, red line uh, the HOLC categories on there, so you can see that um, you know there's a, a vertical line um, kind of going through that. That's a, a I-205, and then a little bit west of that, there's a line where you see the colors turn from slightly dark. Um, all right, have a good one, Amy. Um, slightly darker green to lighter green, um, and those, and so that that's eighty second Avenue that's dividing that, and those are the areas that were annexed later. Um, so we have, have these ongoing east side west side effects, and also to this day, next slide please. You can see that um, there's ongoing impacts of pollution as well. And this is also partially elevation because uh, these areas in the West Hills, like on the tip of the Tualatin Hills here, that there's a green section. Um, I, I guess this is the disadvantage of not sharing my own slides. Um, the, there's a there's a huge park on the west side of town. Yeah, right there. And um, so this is all elevated. Um, and there were industrial areas in the um, in the on the east side um, along the river, all the way along the river, as well as slightly on the west side um, next to that park and then along the north end. Um, and so you can see today, you still see, you, this is not like a hot spot analysis or anything, but you can see generally that the darkest colors are in, in still in e the east side of Portland, um, where it's also lower, there's also, it's also more flat um, and there's less trees. So um, next slide, please. Oh, we took longer on that than I anticipated. But um, so this is to go and get into my present my approach. Um, this is why I'm taking uh, using participatory modeling and doing a community engagement approach. Um, a lot of previous work is focused on experts um, and has um, and has been uh, not less, not uh, not really taking into account the d dynamic uh, um, and the also the impacts of uh, historical decisions in present day. And so my goal with community engaged research is to meet the interests and concerns of community members, activists, policymakers, and and like the pursuit of knowledge and academic research, um, as well as deepen our collective understanding of the systems dynamics causing stubborn legacies of inequity. Um, and then also to bring community concerns into greater salience uh, through working through differences to produce better policies. And then lastly, to contribute to theory and knowledge about the issue by better understanding the factors that drive it. Next slide, please. Just double checking we're on the same slide. Okay. And um, so the general process um, is kind of list, like listed here. Um, and, and it's like, you know, it's, it's working with, um, I'm working to uh, build partnerships with, um, with folks that are actively engaged and have a similar kind of community uh, approach to community engagement that, uh, that I would like to have. Um, and the general process for a group, um, if we're going through this process would be um, in order to kind of collect and, and coalesce our knowledge would be kind of to set the stage. So it'd be kind of creating levels, like uh, doing something to level set everyone, um, having familiarity with uh, helping people develop familiarity with systems thinking and establishing 
what's called a reference mode, which is a perspective on like what is the horizon of the of the problem that we're looking at, and what is the past behavior, present behavior, and future behavior that we um, what is the time frame which we're trying to look at. Um, so then, uh, really, might want to make sure I hold space for storytelling and narrative sharing, um, and that's also holding space for grievances and holding space for directions that may not seem like they're relevant um, for making sure that people have space to describe and to tell the stories of really what, what oftentimes is a, a legacy of distrust um, and harm that's been done by either academia or by government or by both. Um, translating stories as they emerge into qualitative uh, causal maps as a boundary object that we're working with. So making sure we're here, it's a kind of a way of reflecting, like, am I hearing this correct? Like, this is the story that we're telling, am I hearing correctly what, what you're saying? And then clarifying and refining concepts and relationships into semi-quantitative uh, and semi-quantitative model, and then running scenarios uh, of possible policy options. Okay, next slide, please. Um, we don't necessarily need to go into this slide, but it's just, you know, I think that I'm tr we're always trying to ideally work on this um, upper right quadrant of transformative problems uh, or transformation problems, but certainly um, this is a learning problem um, and a coordination problem. Um, and so I'm really emphasizing the left two and then ideally also trying to bring in as much knowledge and learning in the collective as possible to hopefully transform existing um, dynamics that continue to create the same outcomes. Okay, next slide, please. So thinking about critically building upon previous work, um, there's there's a there has been some really amazing community engagement in Portland um, uh, do, through that's funded by um, urban forestry. Um, and things to build on are that they, they used multiple forms of community engagement. They had uh, ethnically uh, and language specific focus groups and representation and recruitment. And they also use community liaisons and nonprofit partners as uh, community gatekeepers. Um, and so, yeah, and then, but then also um, there's some things to be critical of, um, namely that um, this policy, uh, the recommendations are pretty superficial, um, but nonetheless good, um, but they're not like, they're not specific, like plant trees here, or um, it's hard to, and I think this might be one of the reasons why uh, it hasn't been implemented. Um, and so, you know, in addition, um, the urban forestry um, as a whole, through our interviews, we've understood that they are taking very much a top down approach and not really following the recommendations in this report. Um, so, for example, a recommendation is improve collaboration among city bureaus and community partners to clarify and, or define and define roles for planting and future development, improve effectiveness of planting efforts and minimize redundancies. Um, but uh, the article on the right is is uh, describing that um, actually they've eliminated their contract with community partners and they are in, in fact taking a op, using an opt out approach, um, which means that they're going to plant trees. If you don't want trees, then you have to tell them you don't want trees and they're kind of eliminating and devaluing the, the value of, um, of community engagement. And then another recommendation in that light is conduct culturally specific outreach and education communities of color and promote participation in planting long-term uh, long partnerships and relationships with these communities to promote and plant trees, and they're just not doing that. Um, there are multiple agencies involved, so it's not just them, but they're the, they're the kind of um, clearinghouse in Portland. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, all right, so, um, oh, I thought there was one more slide. Well, and really quick, I did wanna talk speak to um, the slide that's not here, which is there's a coalition called Connecting Canopies that is attempting to um, to conduct culturally specific uh, engagement um, and also pay people for their time. Um, and additionally, um, they are um, trying to bridge uh, the gap between uh, what's con with this one narrative, which is um, expertise and uh, and like that only you need a certain level of expertise in order to be able to engage uh, in community forestry. And they're, they're challenging that narrative by build by doing workforce development. Um, and this allows for community members who are um, uh, who are actually affected by the tree, who actually live in the neighborhoods where trees are being planted to be the ones who are, who are doing that work. Um, so um, what does a sustainable urban forestry program look like? And the question is, you know, I have is, is this top down, is this bottom up? Um, my, my approach or my, my uh, argument is that um, civic engagement is vital 
um, for a sustainable urban forestry program. And there might be a combinations of top down and bottom up um, efforts, but overwhelmingly, um, uh, no matter what the approach is, it has to, the civic engagement has to happen, not only because it's just, um, but also because in a supposed uh, democracy in a supposed like system where we want people to have agency over the choices that impact their life, um, uh, the demos, the people need to be invested uh, if if things are actually going to happen in a sustainable way, not only because they vote for for, you know, funding uh, d decisions that are going to impact the general fund and whether or not trees will be invested in, but also because they can volunteer uh, and also because they can report when city when policies aren't when, for example, um, secret tree code is broken. So to me, it just makes common sense that uh, we have to engage folks uh, if we're going to have a sustainable urban forestry project. All right, next slide, please. And so, like, perhaps more than discussed, uh, environmental justice and social justice are intertwined. And I'm kind of hoping to reemphasize this point through talking about kind of some of the pathway effects. So, um, so the question, you know, one question is why are in Portland, why are West Side communities overwhelmingly, on average, much more wealthy than East Side communities? Um, and so drawing on kind of literature about neighborhood sorting um, as thinking about um, neighborhood sorting as a result of uh, external um, environmental factors such as pollution um, and maybe urban heat becoming one of these sorting factors in the future. Um, if we have an, an un, if we have an uneven and equi equitable uh, uh, environment where em environmental amenities and disamenities aren't distributed, um, equitably, then that results in neighborhoods that are um, uh, predominantly going to be of one population or of vulnerable populations. And that inherently then reinforces environmental injustice because those neighborhoods aren't invested in. Um, and so there's kind of this, this kind of ongoing feedback loop that happens and, and we're trying to break, uh, break the negative cycle and create a positive cycle where environmental justice and social justice are um, leading us toward more uh, just healthy, equitable communities. Next slide, please. All right, so just briefly, um, just this is just saying like, you know, we're thinking about the, the dimensions of environmental justice, distributive, procedural, and recognition in terms of how this project is being done. In particular, emphasizing the recognition justice of like holding space for grievances and for grief. Um, there's a awesome like TED talk, uh, some people might have seen by a woman named Liz Ogbu. Is that her name? Yeah. And uh, I can share the link to it. Um, I'm not sure if I have. Oh, I meant to put it in my notes. I'll share it afterwards. But it's talking about, she's an ar architect, and she's talking about the community-based architecture and how she is, how she discovered that, and in fact, through the, through the act of um, designing, uh, for co-designing for communities or with communities, um, that, that in fact, she discovered that she's a healer in that process. Um, and that, and that when we don't deeply engage community um, and hold space for for the for the the grievances and the grief we diminish po the possibility um, possibilities and creative potential um, all right what's my timing I'm kind of running out of time huh I'm gonna try to co keep close this up in like two minutes okay so um, next slide please all right so um, just, just speaking to a few dominant narratives and how I'm addressing uh, these or moving beyond these. And so um, one is uh, the narrative focuses on the benefits of trees without talking about the cost of trees and also sees trees as a, as a, a panacea. panacea. Um, and, um, it, and so the, the point here is that trees aren't a quick fix for the social environmental problems that are not created, are created in urban environments um, and are a result of the way in which we're living on the land. And so if we um, can you briefly go to the next slide really quick. And so if we think about, you know, flooding flood risk, for example, um, that's because of our impervious surfaces. If we think about noise reduction it's because we are, have invested in noisy fossil fuel infrastructure. I think about biodiversity it's a similar impervious surface. So the, they, they, while we, when we're focusing on ecosystem services, we're often focusing on trying to solve a problem that we also need to think about um, solving the root of. The roots of those problems are uh, urban development and the way we've made certain investment decisions. Um, and we have to address that as well. We can't just plant trees and hope for the best. So you can go back a slide. 
Um, then also thinking about technocracy and decisionism. And so um, um, technocracy is, is thinking that, um, you know, it's this narrative that, that urban trees are infrastructure and they exist in a technical domain and therefore um, community input is, should be marginal um, and is not as re not relevant um, to the, the, the questions of information. So like the questions of where can trees be planted um, what trees can be planted. Um, these, these, these like knowledge domains aren't the domain of community. Um, instead, the domain, the community has input that's not, not for, and for that reason, community has input that's far, like far down in the decision-making pipeline. Um, and then decisionism is thinking about um, decisions that are made um, prior, when using, using existing data to just justify decisions that are made for a political motive. A political reason. And so one example might be heritage tree programs. And I'm not saying heritage tree programs are bad, but um, frequently um, uh, it they serve or function as a means to allow for ex areas that have been historically exclusive to communities of color to continue to be so um, and to continue to um, not have not have uh, those areas bear the burden of urban development as populations increase and so to displace that burden somewhere else. Um, and so that would be an example of decisionism if we're using existing data, such as, um, you know, we're saying uh, large form trees have lar have huge have much larger impacts on ecosystem services. Um, therefore, we should keep large large form trees. But actually, the motivation is to keep our neighborhood character. Um, and then um, thinking about an anti-colonial approach to urban greening, I think means we have to think about the, the ecological context and also the social context that. Um, that as a, as a source of inspiration for where we can go, right? And so uh, this valley wasn't a forest, it wasn't treed, it was actually very much uh, oak savanna, and this is an extremely diverse and currently threatened uh, ecosystem uh, due to urban development and agriculture in the Willamette Valley. Um, and then the confluence of these rivers, the Columbia and, and the Willamette, where we, where we live, or Portland is, has always been uh, a metropolitan zone for m many different groups of people. Um, it, and so thinking about how we can, in a healthy way, live with the land is totally 100% possible and requires a radical imagination. So next slide, please. Let's see how I can finish this up. And actually, I think that's pretty much it. Um, you can go to the next slide, and that's uh, just the resources that were drawn upon. It looks like we might not have time for an activity if we want to discuss, but also we could do an activity. The activity was just uh, to see it in action. So if you want to go to the next slide, um, it was to um, begin ourselves to make some uh, graphs over time of things that we think impact uh, audience engagement over Zoom, and then uh, to actually build a little model, um, which um, I did do a practice round with people and it was quite insightful. Um, so um, so yeah, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, I'll just pause there so we can have discussion and um, 